It is so good to see you today. I see a lot of people here at church. I guess you're done traveling and ready for school to start. Take your Bible, and uh, ironically, we're going to kick off our message series on Revelation uh, in Genesis 17. So if you would, firstly turn to Genesis 17. And uh, the reason that we're starting in Genesis and we'll move on to the book of Revelation in this series is that if you don't understand the importance of Israel, you won't understand the book of Revelation. And in this series, we are going to have two introductory messages uh, to the book of Revelation. Today's message is entitled, Why Israel Matters. And next week, we're going to have a message where it's going to be very, a very different message next week. It's going to be an analysis of current events, uh, Russia, Ukraine, those sorts of things, uh, and seeing what the Bible says about prophecy and how the current events are tying in with the prophetic word given in the Bible. So I really want to encourage you to come next week as well. After next week, we'll begin marching verse by verse through uh, the book of Revelation. I really felt like we needed to have two weeks of introduction, one just a message on Israel, and then one just a message on current events tying in with what the Bible says about the end times, and then moving on together into the book of Revelation. Otherwise, I think we would feel a little bit jolted just jumping right in without putting our toe in the water first. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I wanted to give you kind of a glossary of terms that we're going to be using in this message series through the book of Revelation, uh, just because I'm a little hesitant about using big theological words without defining them. And if you're a note taker, you, I, I, I actually met somebody this morning who brought a brand new notebook just for this series. Like that just... That really encourages me just to know how excited you are for this series through Revelation. I've never taught through the book of Revelation before. I've taught on Israel. I've taught uh, what I'm teaching today. I've, I've taught this at a conference in D.C. Uh, on uh, the 70th anniversary of Israel, but I've never gotten to teach through the book of Revelation, so I'm excited about it. But here are a couple of words that we're going to be using in this series and I don't want to have to define them every single time we get into it, so I'm going to define them now, and then hopefully you'll write them down or you'll, you'll remember them. One is the word eschatology. Eschatology is a study of the end times, all right? Bring on the eschaton, a study of the end times, eschatology. Another is the word premillennial, and that's, that's the stance to which I hold, uh, and I'll be teaching from that perspective. Uh, Premillennial means that Jesus will come to earth before the millennial 1,000 year reign of Christ. Uh, even though I am a premillennialist, I'm going to be teaching uh, the amillennial and postmillennial perspectives as well, and then explaining why I think the premillennial view is what the Bible teaches, but also admitting to the fact that I don't know definitively. It's kind of like there are some of those theological stances where we hold to them but we don't hold to them super tight because we, we just admit, I might be wrong here, all right? And it's okay to uh, disagree on stuff. Um, can we admit that it's okay to disagree on things? Yeah. Agree to disagree agreeably. You've heard me say that before. The word rapture is a word that you'll hear used. I'm sure you, uh, if you've been in church at all, you've heard the word rapture. But just to understand what the rapture is, it's an event when all living and resurrected believers will rise in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus there. And so that's what I mean when I use the word rapture. I'll even later in the series, we'll get into uh, the word rapture from the Latin perspective of it, linguistically speaking, and why it's not, you, see, you don't see the word rapture in the English in your Bible, but why do we hold to that so firmly, uh, or a lot of us do, uh, and then there's the word pre-tribulational, the, which is that the rapture will occur before a literal physical rapture of the church takes place. Uh, so um, eschatology, premillennial, rapture, and pre-tribulational. 
So those are all some words that we're going to be hearing about. Also, just uh, another kind of FYI in terms of the introduction to this series. Often when I'm preaching, I think as we've gotten to know each other, you've learned this by now, I'm more of a teaching pastor, um, more of a, a in many ways, more of a teacher than a preacher. It's really going to be much more teaching from the pulpit between now and Thanksgiving than it will be uh, preaching, preaching. It'll be teaching, preaching, okay? Just because the nature of the way that this series has to go, that's the way that it's going to be delivered. So I'm just trying to make sure all the expectations are clear here and that we're able to get off on a, on a very good start through the book of Revelation and uh, I want us now to talk about Israel. Israel matters to people because it matters to God. I want you to say that with me. Israel matters to people because it matters to God. Israel matters to people because it matters to God. God's desire is to bless the people of all nations. And it is a promise that, that has blessed the world. And on this introductory note, Israel matters because the promise and the principle are clear. Uh, one is the promise. The promise is a covenant that's given. If you look in, um, in Genesis 17, 1 through 3, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, and we'll pause right there, uh, it is an unchangeable, unbreakable promise. It is an unconditional promise. There is a promise, a covenant that is given by God to the people of Israel. And that's given in Genesis 17, 1 through 3. Now I want us also to look at the principle. This is a principle of grace. God took Abraham, who was Abram, then he became Abraham. God took Abraham and called him out of a lifestyle of paganism, of pagan worship. And he was then replacing that pagan worship by worshiping Yahweh, the Lord. Uh, this was a relationship of grace. There was no merit on this man's part. So all that being said, I've had like a seven minute introduction this morning, but there, I've thrown a lot at you. Now I want us just to march through why Israel matters according to the Bible. One is the miracle of Israel's conception. The miracle of Israel's conception. Look at Genesis 17, verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So Abraham was past his childbearing years, yet he was given a promise of progeny. He was given a promise that there would be a lineage coming beyond him. And in Genesis 18, 9 through 14, actually, let's just go ahead and read that as well. Genesis 18, 9 through 14. We're not going to have that on the screens, but uh, if you have your Bible with you, you can see it. Genesis 18, 9 through 14. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely re return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And uh, then it says in verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. So Genesis 18, 9 through 14 teaches us about the miracle of Israel, the way that it was conceived. Abraham was 100 years of age. Sarah was 90, uh, just not very realistic to have children at that time. But every Jew is a result of a miracle. Every Jew is a result of a miracle. And God began the Jewish uh, race with 
a miracle. The Jewish race was begun that way. And as an aside, Jews who have a hard time believing in the salvific nature of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the one who saves, Jews Jews who have a hard time believing that, uh, sometimes because of the strangeness surrounding his birth, should note how Judaism begun miraculously in Genesis 18 with strangeness and birth as well. I just think it's important to note that. Um, but Christianity began miraculously in Matthew 1 through 2, just as Judaism began miraculously in Genesis 18, 9 through 14. I'm going to say that again. Just as Christianity was begun miraculously in Matthew 1 through 2, Judaism began miraculously in Genesis 18, 9 through 14. So there was the miracle of Israel's conception. Secondly, the miracle of Israel's continuation. And you can see that if you flip back to the left in your Bible in verse 7 of chapter 17. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout, after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So Israel is eternally indestructible. You've heard me say this before because this is a very important theological stance to which I hold that the church has not replaced Israel. Okay? We do not at Farmington First believe in replacement theology. Okay? That's very, very important to grasp here. Israel, a literal Israel, is prophesied in Daniel and Revelation in particular. It's a literal physical place, a literal physical people. All right? So are we talking about uh, some theoretical Israel that the church has become? No. We are talking about a literal physical Israel. We are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in particular. God loves the whole planet because he created it, but Israel is the apple of his eye. Not America, but Israel. Next week, we're going to get into seeing how God has blessed America when America has uh, blessed Israel and how God has cursed America when America has cursed Israel. That'll be just a brief part of next week's message. But uh, you can see that throughout human history that that's the case. Um, Satan has tried to exterminate God's ancient people and destroy his, his promise over and over and over again. I, I want to just share with you some ways that you can see Israel is indestructible despite Satan trying to destroy Israel and, and God's Jewish people. The king of Egypt could not diminish the Jew. The Red Sea could not drown the Jew. The great fish could not digest the Jew. The furnace could not devour the Jew. The nations could not disseminate the Jew. There is a continuation of Israel that happened from Genesis 18, and it continues all the way until the second coming of Christ. And by the way, we believe in a literal, physical second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming again. He is coming soon. So God's people are kept by an everlasting promise. The Jewish people are assimilated, but they are never decimated. Jews have their language, their land, and their life. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So the Jews are like the Gulf Stream and the Atlantic Ocean. They flow through the seas of humanity, separate and yet distinct. So there is a continuation of Israel. And it's really miraculous if you think about it. Just look at Je Jeremiah 31, 35, and you can see how this is miraculous. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. So if God breaks promises to Israel, he's not faithful and true to his own word. But every single Jew is a testimony to the faithfulness of God. 
the indestructible Jew survives and stands beside the, the, uh, the grave of his persecutors. Now, I want to share with you some things that I think are really amazing facts about the continuation of the Jewish people. Just listen to this. A Jew financed Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World. A Jewish man was on board and was the first to set foot on these shores. Him Solomon financed George Washington in the Revolutionary War. He was Jewish. Both aspirin and Bayer were invented by a Jew. Salk Saban invented the vaccine for polio. He was a Jew. Digitalis was invented by Trebo, a Jew. Novocaine was invented by Stricker, a Jew. The blood test for marriage, the Wasserman test, it was invented by a Jew. Now, don't raise your hand, but if any, do any of you have an infection? Streptomycin was invented by Waxman, a Jew. Uh, psychoanalysis was invented by Freud, a Jew. You ever put money in the little red kettles at Christmas time? That's the great charity Salvation Army developed by the mother of William Booth, who was a Jewess. So all of, all of ancient history, you can see the continuation of uh, Judaism. And all of history really revolves around the names of six Jewish people. Moses, Jesus, Paul, Marx, Freud, and Einstein. Some of you are like, what? I'll say that again. If you think about it, human history revolves around the names of six Jews. Moses, Jesus, Paul, Marx, Freud, and Einstein. That is a miracle race. Let's now look at the miracle of Israel's constitution. Apparently, God thinks Israel matters a lot because of the many miracles that he has performed for her sake. Let's look at Genesis 17 and verse 8. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an ever, everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Everlasting tells us that Israel will exist even after the millennial reign. Pretty amazing. Here's an interesting factoid. So today, we are about 70, a little over 74 years after Israel became a nation again. That took place May 14th and 15th, 1948. And Amos, in chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, it says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. That's what happened in 1948. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. So Israel reestablished as a nation in May 14th and 15th of 1948 and will never be decimated again. They will no longer be plucked out. This was really a military miracle if you think about it. So again, 74 years ago, May of 1948, there were only about 650,000 people in Israel at that time. All right? And they were surrounded by 40 million Arabs. Those Arabs were vowing to destroy them. So the Jews uh, could not carry a gun, but they had to defend themselves against six Arab states uh, around whom they were, sur they were completely surrounded. There was one battle in 1948 where there were 70,000 Arabs who were captured by just 400 Israelis. By the time of armistice, the Jews were 150 miles into Egyptian territory. I'm telling you, God does miraculous things to preserve his promises. How did that take place? How were 70,000 Arabs 
captured by just 400 Israelis in 1948. The fight was fixed. That's all there is to it. Now, God doesn't love the Jew any more than he loves the Arab. But God is, however, sovereign in history. God has a, a will, and he will work in history to preserve his will. So this was not only a military miracle, it was also a sociological miracle that Israel reconstituted as a nation in 1948. A sociological miracle. So the Jews came back to Israel 74 years ago from 61 countries that gathered together. They spoke different languages when they gathered together. This is very, very important. Um, it was said that it would take three generations for these people to become a nation, which is 100 years, but they did it in one generation. Israel is not a melting pot. It is a pressure cooker. So it's a sociological miracle. It's a military miracle. It's also an agricultural miracle. Israel, if you were to ever visit there, you will see that it's extremely rich in rocks. There are a lot of rocks there. The soil is very rocky in Israel. 60% of Israel is desert. It's small. It's about the size of the state of New Jersey, Israel is. If you were to put Israel inside Lake Michigan, you would be able to completely put it in there with extra room for more water. It's not a very big place, but it is a very diverse place. Uh, place in terms of the mountains in the north, uh, the desert in the middle, the greenery in the south. But with water projects, expert horticulture, agriculture, and irrigation, the land in Israel is, bl is blossoming. Interestingly, Israel is one of six nations in the world that raises enough food just to feed itself. They don't depend upon trade to feed themselves at all. It's called the breadbasket of Europe. So for example, the Jezreel Valley, which was a malaria swamp years ago, is now growing avocados, plums, strawberries, bananas. They have record-breaking milk cows there. So it's, it's really a miracle agriculturally. It's a miracle sociologically. It's a mir miracle from a military perspective. And it's also a, a miracle linguistically. Linguistically. Um, and I love, I love looking at this part of it. The ancient language of Hebrew is now studied and spoken thoroughly. Um, one of my master's degrees is in biblical languages, so I studied this like crazy for three years. But uh, something odd about the Hebrew language, for 130 years ago, just 130 years ago, which is not that long in the grand scheme of the length of mankind, 130 years ago, no one spoke Hebrew. Isn't that amazing? It was a dead language, one of the many dead languages, but it's been revived. I just find that so miraculous that God preserved even the, the language of the Jewish people. So we've seen the miracle of Israel's conception, its continuation, its constitution. Fourthly and lastly, let's look at the miracle of Israel's conversion. The miracle of Israel's conversion. Again, look at Genesis 17, verse 8. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God has not given up on Israel. God loves them. Many people love them. And there will be a great revival of faith in Jesus Christ in the last days. I'm going to say that again because that deserves an amen. 
there will be a revival amongst the Jewish people converting to Jesus Christ in the last days. What a great truth. I look forward to seeing that revival. The Messiah of Israel is Jesus. I want you just to hear a couple of these verses and let them trickle over your soul for a little bit, okay? Zechariah 12, 2 through 3. Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. Move down to verse nine of that same chapter. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for any only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, how can God be pierced? God became a man and died. Zechariah 13, 1. It says, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Now, aren't you thankful for God and his holy land? Israel matters. Israel matters to people because it matters to God. I want you to say that with me again. Israel matters to people because it matters to God. I really felt like to kick off this message series through the book of Revelation, we had to have a grasp of the truth about Israel. And again, next week, we're going to look at current events and how they tie in with the book of Revelation in particular and some of Daniel and Zechariah. Now, I want to conclude the message this morning by showing you something or some things from my garden. Now, I, I think I told you last week, it may have been the week before, that I have a weird obsession with my little garden. I, I just have a weird obsession with it. It's not a big deal. It's not a big garden but I have a weird obsession with it. You can see some pictures of it. Uh, This was before, this was the before picture. And uh, we can just go through, that's the other box. I have two raised beds. And there they are with dirt next to them. And then that's after I planted some stuff in them three, four months ago, something like that. And then you can see that's last night and this morning. Look at that, just beautiful, just overflowing. And you can even see my kids holding up some cucumbers because they've worked hard in there as well. All right, I wanted, I wanted you to see some of that. You can take that down. Thank you, media team, for showing that. Uh, I have learned a lot about the Lord in gardening. A whole lot about the Lord in gardening. It's really interesting. Um, I have never gardened in my life until God moved me to Farmington, Arkansas. But I just wanted to pick up a new hobby. And I've learned a lot about growing vegetables and fruit and herbs and all that stuff, but the basic principles remain the same. You work hard, you have good dirt, you water it all the time, and you enjoy seeing the growth. When I started my garden, I had 32 bags of dirt that I bought from the store, and I totally underestimated how much work it was just to transport the dirt from the store to my car, to my SUV, and then to the backyard. 
And man, I really wish I would have bought a wheelbarrow at some point in my life. <laughs> Don't have a wheelbarrow. So we just worked hard at carrying bag upon bag upon bag. And that dirt is expensive, man. I had no idea. But 32 bags of dirt from the store, and we worked that soil. I've, I've had my kids help me with it. And, and uh, Charity's enjoyed seeing our, our girls grow through all of that. But we planted cucumbers, watermelons, cantaloupe, squash, tomatoes, mint, basil, all kinds of stuff, probably more that I'm leaving out. But the difference between the garden on day one as opposed to now is, is pretty vast. It's not quite where I want it to be, but it's far from where I used to be. And here's what I want to share with you, church family. If you want to grow and see fruit or vegetables in this case. But if you want to grow during this message series through the book of Revelation, it's going to require you to put in hard work. And it might be that you are just at the very beginning of this thing and you're thinking, I don't know anything about Revelation. It confuses me. I'm not even sure if I pronounce it Revelation or Revelations. Uh, I don't know where to begin with reading it, it confuses me. And I just want you to know, if you put in the hard work of spiritual disciplines, of reading your Bible, of praying, of going to the Lord, of asking your life group leader, or one of the pastors here, uh, questions as you're reading. And I love getting text messages, phone calls, emails, from church members who are reading the scriptures and have questions about it. That is so encouraging to me as your pastor. But if you want to grow in this series, you're gonna have to work. You cannot just depend upon a 35 minute message every, every Sunday between now and Thanksgiving to grow like you can really grow during this series. So I wanna encourage you, if I say to you, you need to read all 22 chapters of Revelation by such and such date that you'll do it. That if I say, hey, we're just going to be looking at Revelation 1 through 2 and really read that every day for seven straight days, that you'll do it. Because I want to see you grow and I want to see fruit on the other side of this series. Amen? Now, you've heard about Israel, you've heard about where we're going in this message series. You've heard about how to grow. Bottom line is this. If you've heard all this stuff, but you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, then all this is for nothing. So I want to encourage you to make sure that you've given your life to Jesus, the one who is coming again. He could come again today. I would not procrastinate this decision on whether or not you should come to Christ. Come to Jesus today. You say, how do I do that? You confess that you're a sinner. You believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. If you've never done that before, if you've never given your life to Christ, then I wanna encourage you today to do that. Walk forward here in just a moment. Come up to me standing at the front and say, I wanna become a Christian. And I'd love to pray with you about that and talk with you about that. Others of you in here, maybe you need to join our church family. I've, I've talked with several people in the last few weeks who are interested in joining Farmington First. I want you to know we're gonna have a new members class. We're gonna announce it next week about when our next new members class is. And I just want you to know uh, you can begin praying about that by coming forward today and praying through that process of it, of joining the church. Others of you, maybe you have something going on in your life and you just want somebody to pray with you, pray over you, I'd love to pray with you. Or you can just kneel down at the altar. Maybe you feel led today to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and you just wanna pray specifically for that as the Bible teaches us to do. You come forward and do that. But right now, would you stand up with me very quietly, very reverently? It's the most tender moment of the service. I'm gonna pray right now when I close out the prayer with the word Amen. You walk forward, you make a decision for Jesus Christ. Jesus, we pray a prayer of gratitude for the fact that you, Lord, are God. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us today 
to understand that if we've never given our lives to you, that we've got to do it today. Lord, we pray that anybody in here who is struggling in their walk, that, Lord, you would give them an an encouragement to press on, to press forward. God, we pray over those in the church who are in some way struggling or hurting or in need of prayer. Lord, we pray over them right now, praying for your blessings over them, for health over them, for encouragement over them. Those who are mourning in the church, Lord, that you would just wrap your arms around them, Lord. We pray for all these things, all these people in the name of Jesus. Amen.